Everything Old is New Again, America's entertainment pop culture talk show with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. Welcome to Everything Old Again. This is Douglas Viviani, as you just heard, by that disembodied voice and the ever jovial David Cohen. Everything old again. <laughs> is that what he says? That's what you said. Yep. <laughs> everything old is new again. Every, I didn't say everything old is new again? No. Because that, that disembodied voice just really it describes just threw it you. <laughs> um, but um, <laughs> welcome to the now. show. I don't know if you heard that theme music. Uh, that's not as recognizable as some... But for some people, especially those in England, that's extraordinarily recognizable as the Doctor Who, what would you say, theme song? Theme song. That's the original one back from 1960, I think it was 1960. That show's been on 51 years. In, well, in on, England. But for the most part, in England, 51 years. That's amazing. Uh, it's made a tremendous comeback since 2005. They, they rebooted it with uh, you know some new technology, some new writers that were fans of the old show, and really breathed some really um, great new life into this into this show. Now, even if you're not a fan of the show listening out there, please hang in there because we visited uh, the Doctor Who convention on Long Island in uh, November, and we're going to come back uh, you know, at you here this show and next show with our experience at the convention. It's a lot of fun. It was. You yeah. don't have to know the show to listen to our show. It's us roaming the halls and having in conversations with people and, and what we went through at a convention and talking to all. If you are a fan, the, you're going to love these next two shows. We have lots of interviews with the, the stars of of the uh, past and present of this show. There is there is a growing uh, a very I think quickly growing fan base here in the US for for Doctor Who as well. So I think a lot of people here probably would know that that theme song more than they did about 5 years ago. Yeah, absolutely. Um and if you go to a comic book store or if you go to some of these, you know, uh, pop culture entertainment kind of where they sell, you know, st statues and caricatures and things, Doctor Who is all over the place. It's front and center. Yeah. And and when I went to the Star Trek convention in Las Vegas in August, which again, if you missed that show, we did three shows on that uh, a few shows back. Listen to the podcast to, to catch up on everything old is new again dot biz. At that convention, Simon Pegg was there, who is the new Scotty, and he was asked, believe it or not, at a Star Trek convention, which is, I've been to conventions for 30 years, Star Trek, never talk about Doctor Who. It's, a, it's a, like a weak stepsister to the Star Trek fan. But now, all of a sudden, you're hearing this. Like everybody here, I, 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 I love my stuff, and Doctor Who was another show that I grew up on. Uh, Tom Baker was my doctor growing up. I, I do remember John Pertwee, but for me, I met Tom Baker in 1978, and he signed my copy of the Talons of Wing, Wing Channel. Uh, he signed it to Simon 8 from Tom Baker 888, and, uh, and I still have that somewhere. So when I got asked to be in the new Doctor Who, which wasn't a tried and tested thing at that time, it was coming back, it was like a big risk, is it going to work, is it not? It had kind of drifted away a little bit, and um, and, and Chris Eccleston was playing the Doctor, and um, I kind of, uh, I jumped at the chance just to be part of it, and um, I'm very happy to do it, and it was really good fun, it was, it, there was a sense that, that this is going to be good, you know, this felt, it felt kind of cool, and this is, this is a new era for, for Doctor Who, which it obviously has become, with another four Doctors in there, Peter Capaldi is going to blow your minds, uh, yeah, and there's some, there's some very cool uh, guest stars in the new uh, series. And that's, uh... You know Simon Pegg again talking at a Star Trek convention about Doctor Who, and he was asked a question from a Star Trek fan that's also a Doctor Who fan. If that makes right. any sense, I don't know. So it's 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 getting there it's in America, but bear in mind it's been around forever in England. Right, it is permeating the the nerd culture here in uh, in America. It sure is. Let's let's uh, listen to one of the stars of the show that was a star of the show back in the sixties. He'll, uh, he'll describe to you and tell you how this show kind of started out. Uh, I'm, I'm so pleased that a show I did over 40 years ago is, is still going to this day. Because when I left it, it was still a children's TV show at 5.15 on a Saturday uh, after the football results. And I just can't believe it, it's still going. But for me, when they find the old stories of mine and the fans are so enthusiastic about what well, I love it. 
And that's, that's uh, of course, Fraser Hines. If you're a fan of Doctor Who, certainly you know that voice and you know who that is. Funny, this show started out as a Saturday afternoon kids show. And basically, you know, they've kept a little of, of that kind of fun element in it in that, it, in essence, we should describe what the show is as best we can tell, is where there's a, an alien called the Doctor, and he has certain um, technology uh, that he travels through time and space uh, in this phone booth, which is uh, kind of out of date now, right. but back when it was created, it was something that was supposed to be, those, you know, on every street corner and be something that no one would notice. Right. It was a, the, those old style phone booths that were ubiquitous at the time. Right. And but now it's a little out of date. But what, regardless, you, that was his spaceship or his time ship, right. and he would travel and run into aliens that are trying to uh, you know, cause ha- wreak havoc throughout the the uh, time stream. And he would a lot of times be on Earth especially in the beginning, in historical times. And they were trying to teach kids about history through this show. So it started out as a very interesting thing. And the aliens were made specifically not to be so scary because right. it was, again, for kids. So right. it was kind of tongue-in-cheek. And they've kept a little of that, but they've turned a little more serious. Um, let's listen to uh, Terry Malloy and ask, uh, I've asked him a couple of questions. Let's see what he has to say. Why we start. If someone has not had the experience yet, one of our listeners, to, to watch uh, mm-hmm. Doctor Who, where would be a good introduction, a good starting place in your mind? But to start with what's on now, you'll always be able to find out what happened before because there'll be reference back, you know. And I find a lot of kids I talk to, you know, come into the new series, you know, yet you talk to them now and all they're doing is watching the classic series way back in the 60s and 70s and, and, and 80s and, and getting a lot out of that and, and filling in the backstory of, of you know, well, it doesn't necessarily backstory, it's just sort of the interreaction of the, the Doctor with his companions and with the monsters that he comes up against, you know, and uh, seeing the commonality within that. Right, so it's, it's uh, sort of the reverse. It's the, uh, the new influencing the old. In other words, people are watching the new mm-hmm. and saying, wait a minute, what's, uh, what's, what was yeah. this all about back in the day? Yeah. And certainly these episodes, many of them, uh, some have been lost, but many of them are available yeah. to, yeah. to watch. And very much so. I mean, you, you know, the, the showrunners of the show now were fans back in that day. So they're taking that forward and into the show that they're now producing themselves, you know. Um, so you, you, you're you getting that homage backwards, you know, with new stars of writing. And, uh, you know, a lot of the people who are writers on the programme and writers for Big Finish came through that process having watched the classic series and taken on board some of the lessons, some of the uh, things that were uh, were coming through, you know, in storylines and the, and the way the, the Doctor worked or didn't work uh, with various people and and feeding that into the program and it's like a rich fertile soil that is constantly being churned over and more stuff being brought in and the you know the you know the back catalog the you know the backstory of all of it is just is, is interdimensional you know i find it funny when people sort of say oh you can't do that because in the last episode so so happened you think sorry what, what last episode? How do you know that didn't happen, you know, 40 years in the in the future or 27 years in the past? You know, it's a time thing. It can go anywhere. And that's the great, great thing about it. And they have done that in... in, in- and that's me cutting myself off there. Oh, that's uh, nice for a change instead like, of cutting me off. <laughs> so I'm impressed, Doug, that you uh, these people were talking to you again. You're... you're- Really, you're stepping up in the world. Thank you. That's Terry Malloy, and he was the original um, uh, villain, the real serious villain of this show, um, which you'll hear, uh, you know, throughout. We'll explore that a little bit more. Um, I, I did feel that I was getting uh, along with these pretty pe- these people pretty well. The way I, I did uh, watch quite a, a bit of Doctor Who and prepared quite a bit so that I didn't seem uh, silly to these these people. I was I really wasn't a fan before going into this uh, convention. Convention. But coming out of the convention, um, I have to say, all of these guests were so magnanimous. And, of course, we all, most of them have English accents. Uh, so they right. really sound uh, charming, author- yeah, charming yeah. And, and they speak with authority, you know. But it's uh, at least a, an apparent authority. They, they were really open to spending uh, time and answering any silly question that I had. And it was, it was, fu- it was fun interviewing People. The only thing I, I kind of go to is Star Trek, and I, I think of if someone from I don't know some country that wasn't Star Trek really wasn't so popular with came over and interviewed those stars, like they kind of wouldn't know who they're talking to when they're talking to Shatner and have the 
the gravitas. Right. Since I've done all of these interviews, I've looked up these people a little bit more, and they have a level of gravitas, certainly within Doctor Who. We'll hear more interviews with more people down the line uh, in, in today's show and next week's show. We're doing two shows on Doctor Who, but it's a lot of fun. But the fact that they're, that they're really trying to gain a foothold here in the States, I think, is giving them impetus to talk to people. Certainly. Yes and no. None of the people at this particular convention are in the new incarnation. These no, are all but people they're in the, the but they're in the family, the Doctor Who True. family. True, yeah. but they have no financial, I mean, maybe psychologically, but financially, they have no interest in the new show. But sure, they've built, like, they're kind of the foundation of what we're seeing now. So right. maybe it's like their child, and they want to, you know, see the child do well. Yeah. You know, we'll be right back on Everything Old is New Again. Email us at oldnewagain at aol.com. Let's see what you have to say about us. Hello, my name is Fraser Hines. I played Jamie McCrimmon, uh, the longest-running companion in Doctor Who, and you're listening to Everything Old is New Again, Jamie. Yes, Everything Old is New Again with Douglas Viviani and David Cohn. Return, talk, returning, talking about Doctor Who and the convention that we attended recently, getting all these people to talk to us about Doctor Who and what's it all about. Yes, it well, was really. Are we are we going to talk about our experience at the convention at some point? Absolutely. There's there's if you read the outline that we prepared, this has time for that. We'll we'll get to it. Uh, there's an outline <laughs> that you prepared. Uh, well, this is a general schematic of where we're going with this. <laughs> and uh, this particular segment, I want to focus on the 1996 movie that was made by American and English producers to try to bring Doctor Who to America and to try to have Doctor Who, you know, TV series on. American television, not made by the BBC, made by an American production company. It didn't work, unfortunately, but um, many of the actors, or all the actors that were in that uh, creation or in that uh, product were at the convention. I spoke to them, first of which is, um, is Daphne Ashbrook, who played the companion. This series has been around for 50 years plus, and yep. you were sort of in the, the middle of that, and I would suggest that your a participation was sort of a bridge. And do you feel that, that your had any kind of uh, influence on what has happened since 2005? In the Someone who was intricately involved with the, the 2005 startup said that there was quite a bit in the movie that, that influenced the new series. And if you listen to things like um, the music and also the spunkiness and, um, and also the romantic stuff, which, um, yeah, no, 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 I think there was quite, uh, quite a bit that was influential from the movie into the new series. The, some of the character, there, somebody even said once that there were the first four companions of the new series were sort of all a combination of my character. There's a lot of influences there, I think, and I, I really think Stephen Moffat really loved it, and I think he really loved Paul, as, obviously, because, you know, they did the, uh, the online thing last year, so that was exciting. Right. So that's uh, Daphne Ashbrook, and, and uh, she um, was trying to explain, uh, if you're not really a fan of the show, that that the incarnation she's talking about is the 2005 incarnation, from 2005 forward till now, and, and how that 1996 movie uh, advanced this this story of Doctor Who from what we talked about previously in the old um, makeup of Doctor Who where they were more of a tongue-in-cheek and, and a little bit more uh, child, you know, friendly uh, to a real serious product. Because this uh, companion, which the Doctor has throughout his experience in the show uh, is a person that um, goes along and he's get able to talk to them about what's happening in the episode, otherwise it would be no fun. So that's right. the a representation the of audience. an audience member. Now this character, on the 1996 movie, kissed and had a romantic relationship with the Doctor, which never ever happened before. Hmm. For, 19, for the last, like, well, let's say, 36 years before. So that really had the fans up in arms, and that's what she was talking about a little bit. Hmm. A lot of fun. Risque. It, it was risque for Doctor for Who. Doctor Who it was. Um, then there was a gentleman that um, uh, is talking uh, also about how this was a bridge, in other words, from the old to the new, this 96 movie. Let's hear what uh, he has to say. Yeah, I'm, I'm Yi Ji Cho, and I played Chang Li in the Doctor Who TV movie. And that was the TV movie from 1996. Suggest that, that it might have been, uh, you could look at it as a bridge between the old and new, if yeah. you will. Would be, do you feel um, that your place in the canon is, is that as a bridge? Because now you see what's happening since 2005. What was the goal of your uh, show, I would suggest, has been achieved uh, in a large extent 
now with uh, the, the new the new reboot. Yeah, absolutely. Philip Siegel, um, he, he, he was the primary driver behind the uh, 96 movie, and he really, like, the goal was to revive Doctor Who, was bring it back to the people who love Doctor Who. And that has happened. And it's become, you know, this phenomenon. And so, yeah, they, and Phil, bless his heart, Phil Collinson, when, when I was talking to him, um, he, you know, he really elucidated to us, it's like, the show for us was that bridge, and it was a necessary step right because now as you know the doctor being in present day the romantic idea it's not so new anymore you know it's something that's relatively explored and he said he wouldn't have been able to do that if there wasn't something bridging that gap you know there are some things that he he relied upon uh, from the movie in order to make you know in order to help make the new show what it is I mean, what a thoughtful uh, actor this uh, E.G. Cho is. I mean, he's, he was magnanimous and spent a lot of time with me and, and um, really rolled his sleeves up in this role and got uh, involved in this whole production. And he was basically in one episode of one, this one movie. That's it. Right. And he's got a lot to say about it. And it's very interesting um, what his take is. Now, the eighth doctor, there's been 13 doctors. The doctor is able to regenerate himself, and that's how the show continues, where, you know, the same character, so to speak, is played by different actors, um, because if he passes away, he regenerates into another body. So the eighth one is this fellow, Paul McGann, who was... um, also interviewed by yours truly, and he spoke about the, the movie and this movie in general as being a bridge. Today we are speaking with Paul McCann, the eighth doctor. Uh, and the fans, I think, uh, enjoyed your performance so much, uh, and, and um, it left an impression where this is sort of a, a bridge from the old, if you will, to the, the new reboot in 2005. Uh, do you feel in any way responsible, or at least some pat on the back verbally, uh, for, for laying the groundwork for what we're seeing now? I think, well, it's a mixed feeling, because... You know, of course, the chief function of a pilot is to go to series. We failed, as most pilots do. Um, <clears throat> so there was that feeling, and what if, and what could have been. And, uh, and bearing in mind, too, that it was in the middle of what the fans are now elegantly calling the wilderness years. It's kind of cool. Uh, this interregnum, which was years. I mean, it would be another ten years almost before the series came back after we'd shot this pilot. Um... In answer to your question, I think now we feel, those of us that took part in it, and they're all here today, I think we can feel vindicated, maybe, or satisfied, anyway, that um, despite everything, you know, it's cool reception, and like I said, the, the idea that it, did, it didn't even fulfill its remit, really, it was responsible, or partly responsible, for at least continuing the momentum that... that uh, nine years later would see the series return. I think they and, and we know this because elements of it now have appeared, you know, it's become sort of canonized, like that's they're fond of saying. Um, and so, yeah, I think we, we can be quietly satisfied that whether by accident or design, we, uh, we were part of it. I would suggest that there's no doubt that you're a brick in the foundation of what we're seeing now. How about we say it that way? Does that work? Yeah, we'll, we'll agree on that. <laughs> okay, fair enough. You're a diplomat. Uh, thank you. <laughs> And if you caught that, he says, I'm a diplomat. He didn't go for that. I, I, I didn't hear that. It, All right, we're going to have to let's, let's play I this. believe you. We will, you listen to this. We're, we will we'll agree on that. <laughs> okay, fair enough. You're a uh, diplomat. Uh, I heard it. Go. See? Okay. okay. Uh, I just 30, thought he said you're a dip. But I, didn't, <laughs> I didn't hear the low mat. I, I, I like his vocabulary, too, interregnum. I mean, that's a, he's a very well-spoken gentleman. and has do you, a, do you know what that means, interregnum? It, it's something in between two things, a, you're for a bridge, if you will, between two things. And that's what he's talking about, this movie that he was in. Uh, a lot of fun talking to him. Um, and so we've made the point, and we've talked to all of these people, had a lot of fun. Um, there are some villains in this show that, that you, if you watch the show, if you need to get a little feel for it, there's what's called the Cybermen, there's the Master, and there's these Daleks, which we talked about previously with uh, Terry Malloy. Um, let's just um, listen to a little bit about what these Daleks are like. The Daleks have no conscience, no mercy, no, no pity. They are my oldest and deadliest enemy. Doctor. 
Now, of course, if you're a fan of Doctor Who, that is uh, uh, sort of a slap in the face because they're so familiar with the show. Those are the most common villains there are. But we're trying to do a show here for people that may not even be a fan of the show. Right. And uh, those are like uh, robots that um, are looking to exterminate the human civilization and the Doctor's main foe. Yes. So that sounded pretty scary. They are pretty scary and pretty iconic with that the way that they talk. Um, yeah. That they've definitely it's definitely morphed away from a kid show. That's for sure. There's no doubt. Uh, although those things are still silly looking. They, uh, yeah, <laughs> kind of. But. <laughs> um, but we enjoyed ourselves at the convention. Um, it's it's fun to to look back at, at what we did, and we're going to start to now get into what we did at the convention and, and some of those experiences. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. Um, first, I'd like to hear the original Doctor Who theme compared to what we talked about previously, the old theme. Let's hear the difference in, in the music. of Douglas Viviani. Douglas Viviani has been providing quality legal service for over 26 years. We're a general practice firm and can handle any legal matter you may have for a reasonable fee. If you're involved in a car accident, starting a business, planning your estate, or need a criminal attorney, please call 631-681-1910 or email us at vivianilaw at aol.com for a free consultation. Get the justice you deserve. Contact the law office of Douglas Viviani at vivianilaw at aol.com. This show is sponsored by Resume Doctor Inc. Com. When you're looking to change your career, apply for a promotion, or find a job, your resume is the first thing seen that represents you to a potential employer. Make sure your resume makes a clear, concise, and professional impression of who you are so you can get that job. Send your current resume to Resume Doctor Inc. at AOL.com for a free online review. You'll receive a reasonable quote to properly prepare your resume. Let us make sure you have a resume that will get you noticed. Send your resume or questions to Resume Doctor Inc. at AOL.com. That's Resume Doctor Inc. at AOL.com. Uh, this is Paul McGann, the Eighth Doctor, and you're listening to Everything Old is New Again. Hmm. How do you like that? He sounds, it sounds like Paul McCartney, he's saying. He kind of does. Can and he sounds an, like him also. Do, do an invitation. Do this is Paul McCartney? Uh, uh, Paul McCann? Uh, yeah, try it. What does he say again? Play- uh, this is Paul McCann, the Eighth Doctor from Doctor Who. You're can you, can we play it? it again? No. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure you can. Hi, this is Paul McGann, the Eighth Doctor, and you're listening to Everything Old is New Again. Hi, this is Paul McGann, the Eighth Doctor, and you're listening to Everything Old is New Again. Still sounds like Paul McCartney doing Paul McGann. That's what it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about invitations, and we, by the way, we, that's a reference back to our last show, and if you missed it, uh, we did a show on TV, uh, well, not TV, but catchphrases, right. and uh, you can listen to that on the podcast, Everything Old is New Again dot biz. Yes. Uh, we talked about impressions a little bit. Anyway, we're talking about the Doctor Who convention and Doctor Who in general. Uh, we spoke with um, a number of the stars of Doctor Who, and uh, we have Dashley, uh, Daphne uh, Ashbrook talking about, uh, and the next couple of clips are people talking about the longevity of the show and what's it all about. Why has the show been around 51 years? And it, by the way, it's still going strong. Right. I mean, it's stronger going, than ever. Yeah, right. it doesn't look like it's stopping. I did not know what it was that brought up this amazing following, um, the longevity, everything. So I started asking the fans. And what I found out is I think the most overriding quality that makes people fall in love with the doctor is that he's a protector of all. He's a good guy. He's not violent. He sort of fights the baddies with his screwdriver. He doesn't carry a gun. He sticks up for the little guy. And um, there's something about everybody being invited uh, that really speaks to people. And um, I, I don't know if you're, you're you know, getting uh, all of that from her, but um, if you watch the show, you can see that it's, it's inclusive. You're, you're part of this um, experience because you are the companion. They clearly make it where you're asked, the companion is asking the same questions you and I ask to follow what's going on in the show. And that's kind of what she's talking about. Um, let's hear uh, Yi Chi Cho explain it himself about the longevity. Do you feel that there was, uh, there's any reason that you can enunciate as to why this has lasted for 50 plus years? Probably been asked that question once before maybe and, and 
And I think throughout the years, because of this ability to regenerate the the main character into different actors, you've got because you've always got um, an actor has that ability to pull people towards them. A, a great actor has the ability to pull people towards them and 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 make people identify with them and, and want to be a part of their story, right? Uh, and so now you've got the benefit of thirteen or more, I don't know, um, great actors who have played that role and been been leading the the series in that way. Um, and uh, naturally, with time. I'm not one actor can carry a show for 50 years, right? So, you know, they've had the benefit of, of many of them doing that. Not not to mention that the, the roots of where it came from, uh, that sort of fun, um, uh, old school, um, uh, it doesn't take itself as seriously necessarily in its roots, right? And so it's grown up from a very fun, accessible um, place. He's uh, he's really a great spokesman, I think, for this show. And it's a shame he's only been on, you know, that one, ep- one movie. One movie. Um, and believe it or not, his character and this other one, this, uh, uh, well, all of the characters that were in this movie are stuck. In other words, they can't be used by the new uh, that, incarnation. I was just going to ask you that. Why not? Um, there's, this Ashbrook, uh, Ms. Ashbrook explained it to us uh, that, ha- that there's some kind of a legal problem where the American producers own those characters. Oh, man. It's a shame because these are really great spokespeople and I, I, I've seen I just the don't know why they get, can't get over that, get past that. It's a matter, I think, dollars and cents. I think if the new incarnation wanted to bring any of these characters back, they could by buying, uh, if you will, those right. uh, those characters from the American uh, people. Right. But anyway, um, there's also a fellow, uh, Colin Spall, who is there and talks about the longevity a little bit. And let's see what he has uh, to say about it. I have the pleasure of interviewing and speaking with Col- uh, Mr. Colin Spall. And- Brilliant. Thank you so much. It's great to be back. You are a person that has been involved with Doctor Who for quite some time and a few incarnations of the Doctor Who. How many doctors have you uh, worked with? In the television series, I worked with two. I worked, first of all, with Colin Baker, who's also here this weekend. And then, oh, it was about uh, 38 years later, um, they asked me to go back and do uh, play another evil character in with, with David Tennant and Billy Piper. So, twice. But there's a company called Big Finish, um, which do the audio things. So I worked with another doctor there called Paul McGann. Why it has evolved and continued for 50 years, uh, and it looks like with this new incarnation it's got a a new life to it. Yeah, it has, hasn't it? Um, What's its appeal? Uh, It's got to be the writing. The the actor just interprets what he's been given, but uh, the writing's got to be good, and it it seems to be pretty consistent. Um, Yeah, it's it's, it's a combination of of all three. so, uh, yeah, it's a good writing, a good direction. I forgot about that. Good direction. And uh, with good actors and supporting actors, they get in. So there you go. With all those three actors, that certainly explains the longevity uh, right. aspect, I think, well. And so if you've not seen the show, listening to that, I mean, um, it's, it's, it's worth a shot. Definitely. And at the yeah. convention, boy, are people going going uh, berserk, loving this, dressing up as these different characters. That was big. The and dressing up was was unbelievable, as as not just characters, but as the phone booths and yeah. everything. Yeah. I mean, and those Daleks, you know, those, those Daleks little robots. Were, yeah. And a girl had a, a, a dress that was reminiscent yes, of that. Yes, I remember that. Um, little kids uh, dressed up as different doctors. That's, what, that's what's really cool about this, is that it, it's a family show. It really is. And we saw that at the convention. There were families showing up, which I'm sure is different than, than Star Trek. Kind of, right? Yeah. We, well, Star Trek, is, you do see families, yeah. too. Okay. There's no doubt. Okay. Um, but I would say maybe you're right. Maybe there's more families, at least at this particular convention. And it was so nice to see that people can share, um, you know, not to be too sentimental, but really share something that you love, let's just say, as a parent, with your child. And you're watching the same thing. Sure, there's a history to it, but your child's watching it new also. Right, exactly. You know? Exactly. Um, and they can go back, like we talked about some of the interviews before, saying how some of these people will then go back after seeing some of the new episodes and say, well, while there's a break in the series production, let me go back and see on whatever incarnation it is. Let me see the one from the 60s or 70s. I wonder if you ran these back to back over 51 years, like how many how many hours, how many years would it take to watch all of that's this? That's actually a great, like, <laughs> we, that's a great question. We really we'll have should. to do the research. And, and just another thing, I don't know if you saw that, that Yi Ji Chow said that he, he had been asked by me a question that he had only been asked once before. So I thought that was impressive. I caught that, yeah. That was kind of nice. And also, this uh, Colin Spall, uh, he called me uh, this word. I have the pleasure of interviewing and speaking oh, no. with Mr. Colin Spall. Brilliant. Thank you so much. It's great to be back. Listen to that. He calls he me brilliant. He call you brilliant. He called me brilliant. 
billion. That's not what that means. That's not what they mean by that. <laughs> what does he mean? What are you saying? Billion means it's it's a it's a colloquial colloquialism over in the UK. It just means oh, I very see. good, good, right. yes, good. good no, I thought I was brilliant. I thought he was giving me a, like a brilliant. compliment galore here. He didn't, he didn't buy. Did that. he know who you were? Why would he call you brilliant? He didn't even meet you. Oh, I had actually, before the interview, we had to wait. It's a funny story. Um, he wanted a bottle of water. And they give, they give me like 13 minutes to talk to him. I was on the couch hanging out with him for about 15 minutes waiting for this uh, bottle of water. So we became very friendly. Um, so I think that's why he called me brilliant. Because I had a lot of insights about the show that I... Uh, he wasn't spoke. calling you brilliant, Doug. <laughs> Look, you might be brilliant in some <laughs> aspects, but not in that one. I know. I'm digging for it. I, I figured I, I, you know, have a clip of somebody calling me brilliant. I try to stretch it. And, <laughs> I, you know, I try to get compliments wherever I can. I certainly don't get any. Brilliant. Opinion. So the other thing you're talking about is this big Finnish audio. We'll talk about that uh, uh, down the line. But in England, they 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 do audio plays about uh, Doctor Who, and they're going strong with these audio plays. It's fantastic. Um, one of them will use this theme, the Cyberman theme. It's one of the um, villains of. Doctor Who. Everything old is new again. That's one of the things that uh, that Doctor Who fans, I think, love, is they had a uh, a performance from a uh, big band performance the night before this convention right here at MacArthur Airport where we record our show. And they uh, were very big on the music of Doctor Who. That was one theme, the Cyberman theme, and the show has different various starting themes we've played. And so music is important in the show as well. It's very interesting. You know, it's weird as we sit here and... Well, I mean, generally it's weird that we sit here, but uh, we're so familiar with TV shows, right? Growing up with them and everything. And we're not, you know, we're new fans of Doctor Who, right? We don't really know a lot of the history. So it's weird to see, to me anyway, to see these people so into something that's been around for so long. I feel like, what? Uh, what wow, that's strange. Am I like that for other shows? I guess so. It, it is fun because I, I looked at it from the outside looking in, if you, you know, yeah. kind of, uh, at the convention, walking the halls, and we right. had a booth, and we spoke to some people, and uh, we attended some of the, you'll see in some of the other shows, we attended some of the panels. And, um, and it really was interesting to see from a non fans point of view this fandom and it was really, it was fun i mean you, you can't help i think i just just me if you get caught up in it and say gee i wish i was a, right a exactly big fan of the show right you want to jump on board this because yeah, they're having you, so much fun these people you want to be part of the party right Right. exactly yeah. and i was kind of the outside looking in a new fan i mean i did study it i did watch right. a number of episodes and have some fun with with certainly with these guests we should have done the now that you got it how do you get rid of it there then we would have attracted everybody over oh, to oh that would have been nice uh, speaking of now everything oh Old is new again. America's entertainment pop culture talk show with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. Let's start right out. Hey, what happened? As you know, back in 1970, I start on a series called What Happened? And every time something would go wrong, I would look at the camera and say, Hey, what happened? We had a lot of fun with that and a lot of other catchphrases. I got a real red wagon and uh, I can't do my work. And I believe I was the first one to use the phrase, I don't think so. <laughs> well, I'm sorry for laughing right at the beginning. This is Douglas Viviani with, uh, with the spirited David Cohen on Everything Old is New Again. That was Fred Willard. I don't know if you remember that movie, Mighty Wind. And he's doing a little bit of a parody, or if you will, about catchphrases. catchphrases. And that's what our show is about today. Yes. There are catchphrases in, in everyday life. There's tons of catchphrases on television in the old days. Now there's some, but the question is, uh, why do we even have them? Are they used the same way now as in the past? Do we enjoy them? By the way, what is a catchphrase? What is a catchphrase? You know, what's the uh, Webster... Uh, I looked it up, Doug. I looked it up. Uh, catchphrase, according to Merriam-Webster, is a word or expression... That's used repeatedly and conveniently 
to represent or characterize a person, group, idea, or point of view. Well, now that we've lost uh, half of the audience based on that discussion, um, what I would suge ah, suggest Ah, what is, do you mean? There's, really? there's a different definition, too, in television, especially recently, because Seinfeld's got tons of catchphrases where they'll use, you know, the catchphrase in one episode, but then America, who, or, you know, lots of people, go back and repeat and repeat that at the water cooler or wherever else, and so therefore it becomes, I think, a catchphrase, even though it was just once or used once on the show. Right. So what's your definition of a catchphrase? You didn't like the Merriam-Webster? No, I did like the Merriam-Webster, okay. but it got a little technical towards the end there. You kind of lost me. But the idea is it's a phrase that's used over and over again. Do we need to go any further than that? Well, there, that describes a person or a group or an idea, and it says, et cetera. <laughs> okay, well, the et cetera falls under, the, or this falls under the category of et cetera, this I would definitely suggest. definitely falls under the category uh, of et cetera. <laughs> and, and where did it start from? I'm sure the Egyptians had this. We do these, this in everyday life, say things. That, you think and, Egyptians had catchphrases? Absolutely. There's no doubt. Um, ah, the pyramids again? Like yeah, that sort of thing? Something what? like that. Yeah, I, I, I would say that the first recorded catchphrases were from some comedians from vaudeville, though. And the, the best known of those have this to say. I'm a bad boy. <laughs> and that was an ID or, you know, a, a catchphrase that really brought to radio the identification of Lou Costello. And if you notice how high his voice is, it's not always that high in the movies. A right. little, little bit of trivia there. Back in the day when they started out on the radio in the this 40s. This is Abbott and Costello. Abbott and Costello. They were told, listen, you guys sound too similar, the voices. You've got to be different. So one of the voices was a rather high voice that Costello used. And then he accentuated that with this, I'm a bad boy, which was their first catchphrase. There were some others that are they our, used. Are our voices too similar? Because I, I could go up like this if that helps. Uh, it doesn't help whatsoever. Um, in fact, if we sound like one voice, that's fine, too. It sounds like one guy just monologuing to himself. That would be even more interesting. I can go lower also. Oh, that would be good. All right, so do that. All right. Uh, <laughs> let's continue with catchphrases. Well, all right. It's, you sound exactly like the actor in The Shadow. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? <laughs> the shadow knows. I mean, it almost sounds like you. Do that. Do the shadow knows. The shadow knows. Yeah. All right, not bad. Uh, that was iconic yeah. back in the 1930s. From what we understand. Yes, and 40s. Uh, we Orson Welles, by the way, was the first shadow. And again, remember, this is a time when radio was it. There was no television. Uh, again, of course, there were movies, and it was just starting out, and, you know, movies were in infancy. But the point is, there were catchphrases when before TV. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and Play another, another one. really well-known one right now from the radio. Fiery horse with the speed of light, a cloud of dust, and a hearty Hayo Silver, the Lone Ranger. Wait, I mean, that's a great uh, cereal. They call it a cereal. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Not, you know, like Frankenberry. But a cereal was a show <laughs> on the radio that <laughs> continued to go on and on um, with uh, the same characters. And, and, uh, and I guess you could say series is another way to say it. But back right. then. They called them cereal. They called them cereal. And it was just, I mean, the Lone Ranger made its name by, you know, Hyo Silva. And that music, by the way, I would almost argue is a catchphrase. Because every, if you listen to those episodes, and there's, there's, they're still on the air at some point. You can listen to other radio shows that play full old shows. And you'll hear, or on the internet, you'll hear at the end of every half hour episode, when he comes to save the day, that music is being played. And, and became, he'll say that. And it became, I don't know, to me, I used to use that. Like if I had to hurry up with a job I was doing. I'd, I'd start humming it, dun, 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 yeah. dun, dun, you know, to, as, to, to move faster. So it's not part of the Marian, uh, Merriam, Merriam, uh, you know, the dictionary the definition because it's a song, but uh, it works. Right, it that, is not a word or phrase. Right, it but it works. Uh, let's listen to some comic character. And what's up, Doc? I mean, there's, of course, Bugs Bunny. Um, Iconic, everybody knows that. That, right. believe it or not, goes back to the 1930s. That was a short before films wow. uh, were played, 30s and 40s. I think it was the 40s, actually, um, early 40s. Bugs Bunny uh, would come on and, you know, a little short, and he had that phrase almost every episode. Cool. Um, another one that we look back and. How do you know about them? Elementary, my dear Watson. 
There he is. Uh, Elementary Sherlock Radio Holmes. Watson, right? Yeah. So these are the early, early ones, again, from radio, and that's from uh, early uh, you know, movie, uh, movies back in the 1940s with Basil Rathbone um, or Sherlock Holmes. Then in the 50s, we had uh, catchphrases, it, it, pretty much the ones that I'm talking about, where they used once, but then America continued to use them. Let's hear uh, one you hear like that. Do you want to go to the moon? Do you want to go to the moon? Bang, zoom. <laughs> Actually, I stand corrected. That one is repeated a lot on that show. It is. But that show but had a lot of other ones like, you know, Hello Ball. Right. For golf. And Address the ball, ones. Hello Ball. You know, I mean, so that was, um, that was again, it's starting to roll, and you're seeing it happen more and more. And then um, they're all over the place Let's see, in, the six, in the 1960s. Missed it by that much. I see nothing. I know nothing. My name is McCoy. I'm a doctor. What am I, a doctor or a moon shuttle conductor? I'm a doctor, not a bricklayer. Look, I'm a doctor, not an escalator. I'm a doctor, not a mechanic. I'm a doctor, not an engineer. No, you're an engineer. I'm a doctor, not a coal miner. Keep saying that. Are you a doctor, aren't you? I don't know. If you know our show, we, that was from our second episode ever. I just had to reboot re that clip. And somehow work Star Trek of into course. the show. And there, of course, was Star Trek's uh, one of their catchphrases. Again, these are, these are used to, I think, identify more than anything else. We've got uh, comedians that, that have done it, too. Sophia Lorenz, new baby, who said to Sophia, is that all for me? Never got it better. Christopher Columbus, who said to Queen Isabella, I keep telling you the world is round. You're the one who's flat. Never got a dinner. That, that was a Dean Martin. That was a celebrity roast. Yes, right? the He's Dean Martin celebrity roast, and that was red buttons. Of course, he it was hysterical. Never and got a his dinner. whole routine was never got. Was a never got it. That was the punchline to every joke he said. Hysterical the way he used that. We'll come back uh, in a few minutes. We're just going to take a break for a minute, listen to the Long Ranger theme, and come back and continue our discussion right after this theme. I own silver! A fiery horse with the speed of light, a cloud of dust, and a hearty high silver. The Lone Ranger. Okay, and we are back on Everything Old is New Again, and we're enjoying uh, our little extra time here that after the segment of the show, you know, the particular genre or what topic we're talking about, we're talking to you, the listener on Long Island, uh, about ourselves and different things that are happening behind the scenes. Behind the scenes. So I hope you're enjoying With this With Douglas segment. Viviani and David Cohen. <laughs> There's that disembodied voice that introduces us back from uh, commercial. And so what did you do last week? Uh, tell me, give me your thoughts on Captain Balzac. We did that with the pirate Well, I mean, show the first thing week. is, it's funny, um, I, I went, made a special point of saying, you know, we have Captain Balzac here, and I, I accentuated the name, and I introduced you, <laughs> and then, well, I shouldn't say you, I introduced that the, character. Captain the balls he, yeah, he, he was here. And five minutes later, the character's acting as if I didn't introduce him <laughs> and says the same thing back to me. So I, I find it funny that, you know, if you're on the radio with one other person um, and you're actually not listening to what that other person is saying, it's a little bit of a problem. I yeah, <laughs> I'd say. Sorry about that. Uh, that's all right. That's that. But other than that, I thought the character had a tremendous accent. You didn't have to wear the... You know, the, <laughs> the, the eye, eye patch. patch or, the, or that I, fake I, bird I, on your shoulder. But I forgot they can't see that. Speaking of that pirate show, I, I was looking for clips for, and I couldn't really find yeah, them. It just changes time. the subject away from Captain Balls. Well, right? it's the same kind of a thing in that, uh, if you remember, Lost in Space had a pirate. On it, remember that parrot yes. lost his face, and it was yeah. a metal uh, or a it robotic. A, it was a robot, robot parrot. And I thought that was uh, a lot of fun. Um, that episode, I wish I could have gotten a clip for that because that was the, the Robert Newton character again with the R and all that, as we spoke right. about on our pirate show. And if you missed it, tune into uh, us on the internet, our podcast. Everything old is new again. Dot biz. We'll be right back. Right after the theme again. horse with the speed of light, a cloud of dust, and a hearty high silver. 